building new things has led to some of humanity's biggest leaps forward. We made tools, forged new materials, and learned to produce them for millions, and then billions. With every new innovation comes new industries, new economies, new challenges. And we're always looking for what comes next. Three, two, one. SpaceX, Falcon Heavy, go for launch. The industrialization of space, I think, will be one of the great economic booms of this century. Space offers a whole new environment to create things, things we can't make on Earth. Gravity in general is, is something that we all just take for granted because it's just always here. It affects everything. What becomes interesting is what happens when you take that away. Private companies are creating new materials, 3D printing tools, even living tissue, and developing the technology to build entire factories in space. If successful, for-profit manufacturing could lead to a new gold rush, launching the business of space to its next giant leap. Elon Musk and Richard Branson and you know, Jeff Bezos and, and many other uh, industrialists, they're making big investments to go up there, but there has to be a why. There has to be a, a reason to go to space. We want to see a very robust commercial marketplace in space. But the other thing that we have to do is we have to prove we have to prove the industries that ultimately are going to be able to take advantage of the microgravity environment of space. In space, we're opening the way to private enterprise. Since the 1980s, companies have been investigating the unique properties of microgravity, yielding major breakthroughs in the areas of biomedicine and advanced materials research. And now some are looking to start production. Manufacturing in space has at its core the following idea this extraordinary environment with a completely different set of environmental factors than the Earth can enable you to manufacture things that you couldn't manufacture on Earth that have value. Our economy has historically been a, you know, a value-added economy, right? We take raw material and we turn it into steel and we sell that steel for a profit. Finding new ways of making things is historically the makings of economic boom. Three. Two, one, zero, ignition, lift off. In July of 2019, SpaceX's CRS-18 launched with over a dozen new research projects, including investigations being conducted by Goodyear and Adidas. Both companies hope that studying their products in microgravity could unlock new opportunities. Also aboard the mission is a biomaterial 3D printer, and with it, the chance to print whole human organs. Spock, BFF on side four. Go ahead. So you were working with uh, DMC to go ahead and get our command window open a little early, correct? Yes, bandwidth is available. Okay, so I'm just testing where the numbers are and um, making sure they're to a hard stop. Christina, we should be good to go hands-free now. Copy the thumbs up. We do want to start by opening up the cassette kit. It's just past 3 a.m. and the team at TechShot is prepping their initial printing run for the newly arrived Biofabrication Facility, or BFF. Fueled by coffee and the type of food you might expect to find at 3 a.m., the team is working directly with astronauts aboard the ISS, all from the comfort of TechShot headquarters, located just outside Louisville, Kentucky. Now we want to double okay. check that the smart pumps are in the up position. We're going to be sliding the cassette in and we just don't want to bump them with the cassette. I see. That looks great. Um, we are good to go ahead and put the door back on. Okay, copy that. We'll be able to do some printing. Definitely. From the outside, the BFF doesn't look that much different to traditional 3D printers. But inside, these smart pumps are being loaded with living cells. And for the company, 
all eyes are focused on the inaugural drop, paving the first biological brick on the long road to printing human organs. Currently, there's over 113,000 people on the organ donation list, and 22 people are dying every day because there's not an organ available. BFF has that long-term potential to someday maybe be able to provide some hope and a cure for some of those people. This is John Vellinger, the CEO of TechShot, a company he co-founded over 30 years ago. While his latest project just succeeded in its initial test prints, the BFF has a long way to go before it's printing anything as complex as a human liver or heart. TechShot is demonstrating the BFF technology with this current flight, and we anticipate being able to print organs and structures might be five to 10 years out. Bioprinters have been on Earth for over a decade and can print things like ear and nose cartilage that are living tissue. But for complex systems like organs, the difficulty has been printing the vascular networks within the tissue itself. Without vascular tissue to distribute the needed nutrients, any printed cells would die off well before they could be used. And TechShot believes that gravity is a big part of the challenge. So let's just say that you want to create something that has uh, one layer of cells, and then on top of that, a, a different layer of cells, and then uh, on top of that, like a third layer of cells. So one way that you could do that would be to just print one cell in a layer, and then uh, your second layer with another type of cell, and then your third layer with another type of cell. But depending on those materials, uh, over a short period of time, those cells may not stay in those layers. They may settle out and then end up combining. You know, you think of, you know, printing, if you tried to print with water here on Earth, you, you know what would happen. It would just squirt out like out of a water gun. And that is because in a gravity environment, you know, everything wants to just squirt out and wet out and spread out. But in the microgravity environment, you don't have to worry about any of that. So you have a much wider range of materials that you can print with. To combat the effects of gravity on Earth, researchers have used scaffolded structures in order to support the growing cells. Uh, the problem is a lot of ways that that is accomplished isn't necessarily the best for biology. It can limit the types of materials that you can use, and it can also limit the types of cells that can really thrive in that environment. In microgravity, you wouldn't necessarily have to do that. You could have your different layers or areas or sections of different types of cells and put them next to each other, and there are no other forces that are going to cause them to mix. So you have this opportunity to be able to make these small regions in three dimensions in a different type of way and different type of structure that would be very difficult to do on the ground. Microgravity-enabled bioprinting still has numerous hurdles to cross before it can produce a product for sale. Only now that the printer is operating aboard the ISS can researchers begin to understand the correct materials and process necessary not only to print organs, but to culture and preserve them long enough to return back to Earth. But all that time and research is part of TechShot's plan. TechShot's business model is to be a tech engine. We're generating new technologies. And then if we feel like that technology has a potential, commercial potential, we spin that off into a different company or to a different group. They liken their business to Levi Strauss in the 1800s. During the gold rush, Levi Strauss started out by providing canvas material for tents and wagons. And when those miners needed a more durable fabric, the now iconic blue jeans were born. The business model of selling pickaxes as opposed to going out and panning for gold really certainly applies to space and there are many companies at the component level that are providing products and services to launch companies, to satellite operators, to NASA. One of the challenges in that business model is you need a gold rush. It's not clear that 3D printed organs could set off any kind of a gold rush to space. So in order to stay in business, TechShot needs to have other projects, making sure it doesn't keep all of its eggs in one satellite. This is my science fair project that I started in eighth grade. The whole experiment was to see how would the chicken embryo develop in space without the presence of gravity. This science project evolved into the space shuttle project. Imagine this chicken egg in the back of the barnyard. Gravity is causing the yolk to fall to the bottom of the egg. Now the hen has a natural instinct of turning that egg around 
So therefore, the yoke will fall, go back up to the top, and gravity pulls it back down to the bottom again. Now, what would happen to that egg up in space? The project was sponsored by Kentucky Fried Chicken, in which their worldwide headquarters is located in Louisville. And so the, the engineer that I worked with, Mark Ducer, he and I are the ones that decided to start TechShot and start it right here in Louisville, Kentucky. We started in a, a, a motel. Um, it was just two, two rooms, and eventually we went into four rooms of the motel. And then as, as TechShot matured and developed and, and gained more projects and more opportunities, then we decided, you know, we're in this for the long haul. And so we built a world-class research facility here that we're sitting in today. And here, just across the street from that first motel room, TechShot is currently working on 15 active projects creating technology for NASA, the military, and major pharmaceutical companies, all with the goal to support researchers in microgravity. Last year was TechShot's best year in its history. I think that's reflective of the excitement of the new opportunities that are out there for space. And if they're lucky, one of these projects could yield that catalyst of a space gold rush. But they aren't alone in this race. Another company located in Silicon Valley views making things in space as core to their mission, even down to their name. This is fiber optic cable. It works because the fiber reflects light over and over inside the structure. And even if you bend it, the light still comes through the other end. But in this application, it's nothing more than a modern looking lava lamp. The best fiber optic cable is being used to transmit data all over the world. In fact, undersea cables carry 99% of all the data that crosses oceans. Optical fiber, usually made from silica, is important because it can transmit data incredibly quickly over a long distance before needing to have its signal amplified. But research done by the US Air Force in the 1990s proved that it would be possible to produce a fibre known as Zeblan that could far exceed traditional silica fibre. The only catch, it needs to be made in microgravity. Zeblan is an optical glass that has a transmission window that's about five times wider than traditional silica glass, and it has a, it has a signal loss that's 10 to 100 times better than traditional silica glass. This is Andrew Rush, the CEO of Made in Space, a company with a mission to create a new industrial foothold in space. And it sees Zeblan as potentially the first material that can be made in space and sold on Earth. So this is a preform of Zeblan. It starts out as this nice dog bone cylinder, and then it gets inserted into a furnace. This gets thinner and thinner, thinner than the width of your own hair, and then you start pulling that. And so if everything works out, you get a spool like this from our earlier test runs. Basically, it looks like fishing line. While it is possible to produce Zeblan on Earth, it's nowhere near the potential of what you can produce in microgravity. Earth manufactured Zeblan suffers from too many crystals in the, in the material. And basically what happens is when light or power uh, goes through these do crystal domains, they reduce each time, creating a power loss throughout the, the length of fiber you're going through. Uh, microgravity suppresses these formations, and uh, doing so creates more of a monocrystalline structure, so you don't have all these domain uh, drops and you have less of a power drop over that length of fiber. You know, you can go transatlantic and transpacific without having repeaters in the lines like traditional fiber lines do today. You can imagine providing 5, 10, 50 times more bandwidth down the same line of fiber by, by using Zeblan instead of silica. That you begin to, you begin to scratch the surface of the, of the economic potential of Zeblan. They estimate that a kilogram of Zeblan could sell for tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that high price per kilogram is important when it comes to space manufacturing. Historically, the, a barrier to doing a lot of commercial activity in space has been that it costs so much money to get to space, do things, and then come back. You know, it can literally cost like tens of thousands of dollars a kilogram to launch, operate, and return. And that's why things like Zeblan are so attractive, because we can sustainably sell them for tens of thousands of dollars a kilogram. Meaning at some point, whole factories could be created in space. 
receiving raw material from the ground and shipping microgravity-enabled Zeeblan back to Earth. But the problem is, it's all still theoretical. Made in Space has been working on Zeeblan for over four years and has flown four missions to test their manufacturing techniques with more planned in the future. But they still expect to be a few years away from producing a product that could be sold on Earth, let alone scaling that to larger industries. It's very interesting um, and, and a little counterintuitive. The most successful companies in space are the companies that consistently say, how can I do this on Earth? There have been many products that started with the vision of actually manufacturing in space and ended up with a discovery phase in space and manufacturing on Earth. And that's good news for consumers. That's good news for the end users of those products because that reduces costs. You don't build your manufacturing plant on the most expensive real estate you can possibly get a hold of. You build your manufacturing plant where you can manufacture economically. For Made in Space, though, discovering the first product that can truly be made in space is more than just profit and loss. The establishment of space manufacturer Zeeblan as a product line is, is core to our vision, right? That's, that's the industrialization of space, right there. That's the Netscape moment of low Earth orbit commercialization. If in our research and development for Zeeblan, say, we found ways of improving Zeeblan that we could actually apply terrestrially, like apply in, in a gravity field, we would be excited about that. You know, for us, we'd take the profits from that and plow that back in and doing more cool space stuff. And while the company is also investigating other materials like Zeeblan that can be produced in space, they've already laid the groundwork for a whole new way of thinking about in-space manufacturing. And they call it Arconaut. So Arcanon is, is one of many steps toward those broader visions. Arcanon is a, more of a capability than a thing. The capability can enable virtually anything you can think of in terms of structures in space. Uh, you can build large things, small things that are optimized, it doesn't really matter. Arcanaut blends robotic manufacturing with 3D printing, allowing it to create and assemble products in space. Meaning, instead of flying something, like say a satellite to space, you could create them there. But before Made in Space can use Arconaut as an in-space factory, it needs to turn its vision into a sustainable business. There is no shortage in space of visionaries. What I really want to try to achieve here is to make Mars seem possible. The visionaries that we are seeing succeed are the, the visionaries that, that attach their vision to an incremental pathway. We've been very fortunate to work closely with NASA for a number of years in developing uh, gravity-independent manufacturing technologies. And the first one of those technologies that we really tackled was 3D printing. The International Space Station has its own 3D printer, and look at this. Astronauts created the first object to be made with it. It's a white printer part. The first print that we did was a little a plate for the printer, um, and it's a NASA and it said made in space on it. Is it fair to say like the first thing you made in space is a marketing material? <laughs> I mean, we, <laughs> the first uh, we we actually kind of joke that the first thing we did was demonstrate that you could make like self-repairing robots in space. To date, Made in Space has created over 200 objects aboard the ISS. And with its second printer, named the Additive Manufacturing Facility, they were able to not only prove their technology, but turn it into a business. We struck kind of an interesting deal with them where we actually retained ownership of the device and, and actually operated as a service and you know, printed parts for NASA, uh, for other individuals, for companies, for schools. So really starting to build almost this machine shop in space kind of business model. The approach that we've taken at Made in Space has been to have these really great, this really inspiring big vision. We take those big, that big vision and we decompose that into digestible chunks, like steps like along that path toward these fantastic futures. And that first incremental step for Arconaut is to change how we think about manufacturing satellites. Arconaut 1 project is a free-flying satellite which will manufacture 10-meter booms, and those 10-meter booms will have solar arrays on them which allow a small sat to manufacture on the order of about a kilowatt of power. 
The Arkanaut One mission will launch in 2022. It's part of a public-private partnership with NASA, and the project aims to reduce the cost of putting satellites into orbit. While satellites have been getting smaller, if you need a satellite that'll require lots of power, you'll most likely need a massive solar array. But large arrays are difficult to fit into rocket payloads, the so-called tyranny of the fairing, and it gets expensive. One way around this problem was to spend heavily on engineers to devise solutions for folding arrays into compact configurations. Then deploy at their full size once in space. But all that work and extra weight on a rocket can add tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars to a launch cost. Arconaut gives satellite makers a new option. Include a 3D printer and robotic arm onto their existing satellites and let Arconaut build their very large solar arrays in space. This could reduce the cost of getting power-hungry satellites into orbit and potentially open up whole new industries to space. Probably the most significant factor for the financial success of a space-based or space-related business is economies of scale. The more activity there is, the more feasible it is. Both Made in Space and NASA hopes that Arconaut will help reduce the cost of doing business in space. But it's still unclear whether larger and cheaper solar arrays is the answer to finding scale in production. A successful strategy for manufacturing in space is to demonstrate capabilities and to have adaptable capabilities that can serve different customers. When you combine that robotic assembly and additive manufacturing, it really opens the door for customization for clients. You know, folks may say, hey, I actually don't need that much power because of my mission, I need, but I need a big antenna or I need a large radiator. Arconaut, because it's general, means that I can provide those services uh, quickly and at low cost. So we hope that folks see what we're doing and are inspired by it and say, hey, this is what I need. So yeah, it'd be great if somebody came to us and said, this is the thing that we want to make. And we're like, oh my gosh, that's, that's the killer app. The hope for Arconaut, just like with Zeblan and organ printing, is that one of these businesses can be that spark for space industrialization. I think um, once people see the potential of microgravity, I think a lot more people, a lot more commercial entities will get involved in space research because I think it is such a unique environment. That, that different way of thinking leads to innovation. And so I think you see so much excitement and so much interest because the potential to come up with new products, new innovations um, is real. The ability to manufacture in space means that we kind of break the tyranny of the of the launch variant, right? And we can now make structures that are really enormous, like make structures that are on the size and scale of things that we're we're comfortable with and we interact with on Earth, you know, on a on a you know a consistent basis, you know, like larger buildings, multi-story buildings. Nothing like that exists in space. But we need to be able to make structures and spacecraft and habitats that are that size if we are really to, to you know, sustain, sustainably move into space, move into low Earth orbit, and beyond. And as industry enters low Earth orbit, we'll begin to explore the next financial future. The Moon, Mars, even asteroids contain potentially invaluable resources. On the next giant leap, we'll explore the private companies developing the technology needed for off-world mining. But in order for it to become a business, it'll take another giant leap. <laughs>